we want you to lift your hands. Give God his praise. For he is worthy. He's worthy of all of our praise. We love him. We praise him. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Come on, let us stand to our feet and bless the Lord for allowing us to be in the service just one more time. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Oh, Father God, in the name of Jesus, again, Lord, we thank you. Thank you, thank you, Father God. Oh, Lord, we thank you for last night's sleep and this morning awakening. And we thank you, Lord, that you allowed us to assemble here in your house of prayer just one more time. And so now, Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we know that you are already in this place. We pray, Lord, that you would fill this place with your Shekinah glory, Father God. Touch us, Lord, in such a way that we know that we have been touched by you. In Jesus' name we do pray. Let all of God's people say amen. Amen, amen. amen. God bless you. Heaven smile upon you. We invite you to stand and sing along with our mass choir as they usher us into the presence of the Lord. Amen. Come on, y'all. Come thy fount of every blessing.
God be praised. While we're still standing, let us have a moment of kononia and fellowship with one another in the name of Jesus. Amen. time we'll be blessed with another selection by our mass choir.
Street Baptist Church and our Sunday morning worship experience and we just want you to know that we're just hallelujah glad that you decided to come and be a part of this worship experience on this first Sunday in the beautiful month of September. Amen. Amen. To God be the glory. Again, we want to welcome those that are here in the sanctuary as well as those that may be watching online. However you're here, we want you to know that we're just hallelujah glad that you are here with us today. Amen. Amen. Do we have any first-time visitors that are with us this beautiful Sunday morning? Would you please stand that we could share some love with you? Hey. Amen. God bless you all. Amen. To God be the glory. Amen. Again, on behalf of all the officers and members of this great church, we want you to know that we're just hallelujah glad that you decided to come and worship with us here today at Martin Street Baptist Church. And we just pray that something is said or done that not only blesses you today, but blesses you all the days of your life. And you're always welcome to come back and worship with us here at Martin Street Baptist Church. And remember, wherever you are in Raleigh, don't worry, all roads lead to Martin Street. Amen. 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 God bless you. Heaven smile upon you. Amen. This has been a beautiful, beautiful week. I tell you, y'all, I pray that some of those waters that lead to longevity, I pray that they fall down on me. Amen. I see Sister Geraldine is here. Her mother, Sister Classy Moore, she hit 99 years old this week, y'all. Amen. To God be the glory. We were able to get on the phone and talk with her. That's a, that's a great thing. 
And Sister Ola, her mother, is turning 100 years old. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Whatever they've been drinking, I hope they just bring a little bit of it and put it up here. <laughs> Let it fall down on me. Amen. Those are some big numbers. So we thank God and praise God for those celebrations. Amen. And we share with you all in the wonderful things that God is doing. Amen. Brother Abe again, good to see you here today. We know this has been a difficult week for you and your family. We certainly pray God's blessings and continued over you and your family during this difficult time. Amen. At this time, we want to certainly call your attention to our announcements as they come across our screens. And we always start by asking that you would please pray for our sick and the shut-in. Again, we know that there's some among us that would like to be able to get out and about, to be able to come to church, but we know that the body will not allow them. So those of us that know that there is power in prayer, we ask that you would please pray for them so that in your time of need, somebody will pray for you. Amen? Amen. Amen. And speaking of prayer, we certainly want to invite you to join us on each Monday morning uh, at 7 a.m., even tomorrow, even though it's a holiday, prayer still go up on holidays too. All you got to do is just dial in 727-731-2675. Uh, there's no passcode to get in. Uh, we're not up there all day, but it's a wonderful way to get your week started on one accord with your fellow church members. Membership is not required. So you can tell your family and friends to just dial in and join us for a start to our week in prayer. Amen? Amen. Uh, tomorrow the church office will be closed in observance of Labor Day. Uh, we pray that everyone will be safe. Amen. We pray that you will just govern yourselves accordingly and let's just have a safe and prosperous, whatever you're doing on Labor Day, enjoy yourself. Amen? Amen. This is a reminder that on Wednesday, September the 13th at 7 p.m., we will resume with our Bible's weekly uh, Bible study. We will continue with our journey through the Gospel of John. Uh, uh, the sheets will be coming out. We're probably going to attempt to get them out a week early so that you'll have time to get back in the mood of uh, studying and preparing uh, for Bible study. We certainly invite everyone to join us uh, for Wednesday night Bible study. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, we're going to invite Sister Iris Robinson. She will come as, uh, with an announcement for our sixth pastoral anniversary. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. 1 Timothy 5th chapter 17th verse. On Sunday, September 17th, we will celebrate the sixth pastoral anniversary of our pastor, Dr. Sean J. Singleton. Our theme for the day will be a worthy servant. Our guest preacher will be Dr. Harold C. Miller, the senior pastor of Tupper Memorial Baptist Church. Dr. Miller will, will feed our spirit with a word from the Lord, and then following the morning worship, we will feed our bodies with a light reception in the Family Life Center. I invite each of you to pray daily for our church and, and our leader, and most importantly, I invite you to join us for this celebration. Oh, and bring a friend or two along with you on Sunday, September 17th, as we celebrate the pastoral anniversary of our worthy servant. Thank you. Amen. Amen. To God be the glory. Six years have just flown on by, so we certainly look forward to that. We want to say thank you to our, our deacon's ministry. Our deacon's ministry, this is a picture of the several boxes that they supplied all of our teachers. You know, we have our back to school thing each year, and we bless our students. Well, our deacon's ministry took it upon themselves to put boxes together with uh, school supplies and, and resources for all of the teachers here at Martin Street Baptist Church. And to all of the teachers, again, on behalf of all the members, we want to say have a blessed school year. We're certainly praying for you. Uh, and we're praying that all goes well. Amen. Uh, we want to have any incidents involving any school, but certainly not involving any one of our teachers or students here at Martin Street Baptist Church. So again, thank you to our deacons ministry. Amen. Amen. Again, on behalf of the Sargent family and young Allison Sargent, uh, we want to say thank you for your donations. As you can see, uh, Martin Street really blessed uh, her and blessed note in the pocket 
uh, three of those containers plus she was able to fill up with donations uh, and so we've been able to again share the blessings that God has given us with our community and we just want to say thank you thank you thank you for whatever contributions you were able to make again it certainly encourages her heart and I'm sure it will be an encouragement to all of those that will be blessed by the contributions amen amen, amen. again I just thought this was just wonderful uh, for those of you who know Shaw University and you know our beloved uh, uh, Al Carter was a longtime AD and Hall of Famer. I don't know how many of you can see it, but this year on, on the back of the helmets for the football team, they got a little, a little thing that it says AL, it says Al Carter. And what their slogan for this year is play for AC. Amen. So they're, they're going to dedicate. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So if you're a supporter of Shaw University, you make sure you go out and support them every chance that you get, because every time they take the field, they're going in the field uh, just to say that we're going to play for AC. I thought that was just the nicest thing, uh, a small gesture once again to show the appreciation for all he did for Shaw University. And as we all know, he loved himself some Shaw Bears. So again, we thank them for honoring, continuing to honor him uh, even though he is gone. Amen? Amen. 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 Again, I say this every week. Uh, thank you for your kind and your generous support of Martin Street Baptist Church. Look, we just got our, our monthly financials, and let me tell you, God is being so good to us. Amen. Amen. We, here we are post-pandemic in, in many ways, and, and unlike many churches, we are outpacing our pre-pandemic giving here at Martin Street Baptist Church. Amen. And I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna stand up here and say, I don't know how we're doing it. We're doing it by grace and mercy. And we're doing it by faithful giving, amen. And so I just wanna thank the members of Martin Street Baptist Church and all of our friends that have been so kind and so gracious in all of your contributions because listen, it ain't this way everywhere talk to pastors all over, not just Raleigh or North Carolina, but all over the country, and many churches are, some are going to two Sundays a month, some pastors have gone from full-time to bivocational, some have had to move on to other churches, some churches have closed down, so don't, don't make it seem like it's just a small thing to be able to say that we have members that love the Lord and love their church and have been sowing seeds faithfully into Martin Street Baptist Church. And so, as Paul would say to the church at Galatia, sowing the right seed, it always, and I mean always, brings the right harvest. And we just want you to know that we are just thankful for you and your kind and gracious giving. Amen? Amen. If you're here in this, yeah, you go ahead and bless the Lord. <laughs> Amen. If you're here in, in the sanctuary and endeavor to make a contribution, uh, we have... Uh, offering boxes, one over to my right on the State Street side, one in the rear, and one in the Annex building. If you're watching online or throughout the week, if you want to make a contribution, you can mail in contributions to Martin Street Baptist Church, which is located at 1001 East Martin Street, Raleigh, North Carolina, 27601. Or if you're in the Raleigh area, you can drop off donations at the church office. There's a mailbox located right outside outside the, the front door that is always accessible. If you do electronic giving, you can use the Cash App application. Just put in dollar sign MSBC offering and 100% of those donations come directly to the church. Or you can go to our church website, www.martinstreetbaptist.org. And if you go to the online giving tab, there you will be able to see there's multiple ways that you can give Give unto the Lord as the Lord has given unto you, always remembering that God, he loveth a cheerful giver. And you are never more like God than when you give. And so again, we thank you for all of your kind and gracious contributions to Martin Street Baptist Church. Amen? Amen. Amen. To God be the glory. We're now going to have our Sunday morning scripture and prayer brought to us by Deacon Janice Sinclair. Amen? Amen. Hear ye her. Good morning, church. Our scripture reading this morning will come from Psalms 107 of the King James Version. And it reads, 
Oh, give thanks oh, unto give the thanks. Lord, for he is good, yes, for is. his mercy endureth forever. Yes. Let the redeemed of the Lord say Hallelujah. so, Hallelujah. whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy, and gathered them out of the lands from the east and from the west, <laughs> from the north and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in, solita in solitary way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distress. And he led them forth by the right way that they might go to a city of habitation. Amen. The word of God for the people of God. And praise be to God. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come this morning with a thankful heart, knowing that your word tells us that if we lift our eyes to the hills from which cometh our help, we know that our help come from you. Lord, if we need, we need your precious word. We will not let, you will not let our foot be moved, for you never slumber or sleep. I pray that we will always, and I mean always, Lord, Keep our eyes stared on you. Dear Heavenly Father, help us to set our mind on you and to commit ourselves to seeing you and the things of your kingdom. Help us to be merciful in a way that honors you, O oh Lord. Help us, dear God, to demonstrate the kind of goodness and righteousness that comes only from you. Father, I pray this morning for our pastor and his family. Lord, give him the strength to stand firm in the faith. Help him to preach the gospel with power, courage, and with strength through the Holy Spirit that comes directly from you, O oh God. Lord, I pray this morning for our children, our nation, and the entire world. Father, I feel that we are living in tumultuous times. It is a sad day, dear Heavenly Father, when children cannot go to school without the fear of being shot, and when innocent people cannot go about their daily lives without the fear of being killed simply because of the color of their skin. But through it all, dear Heavenly Father, through it all, we know that all power is in your hand. Yes, yes. For Father, if we know that if we see the stars, and we hear the rolling thunder, for we know that your power throughout the universe is displayed. Then sings my soul, yes. my Savior God to thee, yes. how great thou art, how great thou art. Yes. Then sings my soul, yes. my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. I love you, Lord, and I praise your holy name. In Jesus' name, I pray this prayer. Amen. Amen.
share today, those of you that have your Bibles and venture to turn with us, we invite you to turn to the book of 1 Corinthians, 15th chapter, the last verse, number 58, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, and I will be reading from the King James Version of the Holy Text, and there 
you will find these words written. It says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of our Lord. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing, especially the doing of his holy word. Father God, in the name of Jesus, again, Lord, we thank you, we praise you, and we do honor you, Lord, for everything that has been said and done here in this worship experience today. We pray, Father God, that everything was done in such a way that it's pleasing and acceptable in thy sight. O oh, Lord, our strength and our redeemer. And now, Father God, your manservant, I pray, Lord, that you would hide me behind the cross, that only you might be seen. I pray, Lord, that you would speak to my mind and you would speak through these lips of clay that I might give your word as you've given it unto me. And then, as always, Father God, I ask for preaching power, the kind of power that makes preaching easy. And, Lord, I ask all these things in your son Jesus Christ and our Lord and Savior in his holy and his precious name. And let the church say amen. Amen. For the time that we have to share today, church, I, I want to echo the words of Paul by saying, your labor shall not be in vain. Your labors shall not be in vain. For a lot of us, tomorrow, church, to be honest, is just another day of rest and relaxation. Before we get back on Tuesday to the hustle and bustle of going to work. That's all it is. And then for some of us, Tomorrow is a day to get together with family and friends and to just hang out and have a good time. Because as we all know, tomorrow is the day that some have dubbed Labor Day. How fitting the day of labor is the day we take off. <laughs> and many of us celebrate this, this Labor Day holiday without really knowing where it came from or what it is all about. Those that may not realize it, that Labor Day wasn't always this meaningless holiday on the first Monday in the month of September. But it actually goes all the way back to 1882 when some 12,000 labor union workers in the state of New York decided to take an unpaid day off. And on their unpaid day off, they decided to, to, to march from their labor union headquarters down to City Hall. And the purpose for their rallying and their marching was to, to bring some, some perspective as to what they believed. What they believed was that it was the labor force here in America that was partially and mostly responsible for all of the success in this country. And over the next 12 years, many companies and many states began to, to give employees that day off as a paid holiday. Then finally, in 1895, you know the government, they'll sooner or later come around and do the right thing. 1895, the government decided to get on board and decided to make the, the first Monday in the month of September a national holiday, a, a paid day off called Labor Day. The government proclaimed that, that this was a day to honor the, the men and women that had labored in order to make this country what it was. I want to suggest to you today, my brothers and sisters, that there is no group of men and women, and I mean no group of men and women that have worked any harder or labored any longer in order to make America what it is today than those that have been laboring for the Lord. You see, because God has already declared that the harvest, it is plentiful. God said that it's the labors that are few. What God wants you to know is that if you're one of those that have been out there laboring and working hard for him, you may not always get the recognition. 
You may not always get everything that you want, but he does want you to know that your labors are not in vain. You see, because God recognizes that, that everybody might not see what you're doing and everybody might not know what you're doing, but God does. And if nobody else tells you thank you, if nobody else tells you that you are appreciated, then God wants you to know that he appreciates everything that you have done for him. God also wants you to know that the day will come when he will reward you for your labors. God wants you to know that, 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 that you all you need to do is don't worry about when the reward is going to come. You just keep on working. Just keep on laboring. Just keep letting your little light shine. You may not get the fame and fortune. You may not get all of the riches and recognition on this side of glory. But God wants you to know that there is something waiting for you on the other side of glory. You do remember Jesus said that in my father's house there are many mansions. And he said, if it were not so, I would have told you so. And so again, I don't know about anybody else, church, but, but I'm going to keep on working and keep on laboring for the Lord. And I'm going to keep on pressing towards the high mark of Jesus Christ. Because here's what I know. I know that what God has for me is greater than anything this world can ever do for me. And I know that everything I've done for the Lord has not been in vain. And so, church, with that in mind, as we turn our attention to this text, many of us call this the, the book of 1 Corinthians. But the truth of the matter is, the ending of 1 Corinthians is actually the conclusion of Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth. So what was really read into your hearing was not the ending of Paul's first letter, but this was actually Paul's final farewell and benediction to the church at Corinth. So after Paul had told them that there is no temptation taken unto you such as common unto man. After Paul had said to them that now abide is faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. After Paul had said that we have this treasure, an earthen vessel, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Paul sums up everything that he had said to the church at Corinth by saying, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know, Paul said, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And so church, if you don't mind, I want to use Paul's benediction to the church at Corinth. I want to use it as a word of encouragement for all of those that have not been out there laboring for the Lord. Because Paul wants to encourage you here today. And Paul's first words of encouragement to all of those laboring for the Lord is, don't ever give up. Just don't ever give up. I wish that I could stand here and tell you that everything was going to go your way. I, I wish that I could tell you that every day was going to be a good day. But the devil is a liar. And I can't tell you that. But Paul starts this text by saying, Therefore, my beloved, beloved brethren, be ye steadfast. This was Paul's way of telling them, Look, after all the stuff that you have been through, after all the stuff that has happened to you along the way, look, you got to find a way to just keep on going. You, you got to find a way to keep pressing through whatever it is that you're going through. Because here it is, church. The easiest thing to do in life is quit. Come on, somebody. We all know some folks that are all in. They, they, they give you all their support. And the moment something don't go their way, the moment somebody does something they don't like, they quit. And they throw in the top. But you got to have something on the inside of you that says, even if it don't go my way, I'm going to keep on going. Even if things don't seem to be working out, I'm simply going to keep on going. 
There comes a point in all our lives when we're going to run up against something that's going to challenge us and is going to make us feel like throwing in the towel. That's church. When you just got to make up in your mind that no matter what comes my way, the one thing I will not do is I will not quit. That's what you got to say. Because here's the truth about life again. Things ain't always going to be easy. The road is not always going to lead where you want it to lead. And things will not go the way that you always wanted them to go. But no matter where the road leads and no matter how things end up, you just got to know that wherever I end up, that's exactly where God wanted me to be. And if God wants me to be there, then God has a purpose for having me there. Because no matter where you are, church, you cannot be successful in life until you have done what God has called you to do. And sometimes, church, I tell young people this all the time, even my own children, sometimes in order to find your divine destiny, in order to live out your divine purpose, you got to be willing to go through some stuff. Come on, somebody. You, you got to be willing to have some doors shut in your face. You got to be willing to have somebody tell you no every now and then. Yet, just keep on going. You got to do it with an attitude that says, despite what comes my way, I will not give in, I will not give out, and I simply will not give up. Because here it is, church, I know, and this is what you got to tell yourself, I know that God has something in store for me. And what God has for me is for me. And I'm going to keep on going until I get it. But sometimes in order to get what God has for you, you got to simply hold on in the midst of what it is that you're going through. Here it is. Because no matter what it is that you're going through, if you can't hold on to anything else, you ought to be able to hold on to this. God has made you a promise that he will never put more on you than you can bear. Which means that if you're going through something or if God has put something on you, the good news is God knows that you can handle it. And that's why, church, no matter how hard it gets, you just got to make sure to tell the devil, I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give up. And the moment you get tired of trying, and tired of fighting, that's the time to, 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 to find God in the midst of what you're going through. Some of us in here know that when you're going through something, that's the time when you got to meet it squarely face to face. And then you got to lift your chin, set your shoulders, plant your feet, and take a brace. That's the only way you're going to be able to see it through. And if you're going to see it through, then you got to have something on the inside that refuse to let you give up. But the second thing, the second thing the Texas Taylor to teach us is not just don't ever give up, but don't ever go differently. Don't ever try. You know, some people try to get so creative. They're so spiritually minded, they ain't no, they ain't no earthly good. <laughs> they they, they want to they make everything a spiritual conquest. But Paul says, be ye steadfast, unmovable. And when we look at this text, Paul is reminding the saints at Corinth to not be moved by all the stuff that they saw going on around them. And the reason, church, that Paul was reminding this church of this fact was because Paul understood where they were. Paul knew that if there was any place in the world where a saint of God could get off the straight and narrow, if there was any place where a saint could miss the mark or stumble and fall, Paul knew that it was in Corinth. <laughs> because Paul knew that there was some stuff going on in Corinth, all oh, that what happened in Corinth usually had to stay in Corinth. You see, because Paul understood, having been there, that Corinth was full of Greek mythology. It was full of idolatry, adultery, 
and fornication. Paul understood that Corinth was the modern day Las Vegas and it was better known as Sin City. So Paul was trying to encourage these saints that in the face of all of this mess that's going on around you, you just got to learn to stand on the truth of God's word. And while you're standing on the word, Paul said, here's what you got to do. You got to be unmovable. And some of you all know that the moment you step out the doors of this church, the world is going to be at you. Come on, somebody. The world is going to be telling you, this is how you're supposed to do it. This is the way that you're supposed to go. If you want to be successful, then the world wants you to know you got to do it the worldly way. But again, that's why you got to learn to be in this world, but not of this world. And when we come to church, Here's one of the things we got to learn to do, church. We got to learn to leave the worldly stuff out in the world. Because everything that works in the world was not designed to work in the church. Come on, somebody. That, that at some point, there's got to be a separation, a delineation, and a difference between what happens in God's house and what happens in the world. Come on, somebody. I know when you're getting out in the world, you can say anything you want to say. You can act any way you want to act. But it ought not be that way in God's house. We got to learn that when we come to God's house, we got to learn to do it God's way. Because God told us in the book of Isaiah that his ways are not our ways. Just as his thoughts are not our thoughts. But God also let us know that if we were to do it his way, that not only will we have life, but we can have it more abundantly. I don't know how many people really want the abundant life that God has promised us. But God said that if you want the abundant life that he has promised you, then you got to be willing to deny yourself, pick up your own cross, and follow his way. you really want to follow God's way, then you got to keep yourself on the straight and narrow. Because here's what the word says. The word says, wide is the gate and wide is the road that leadeth to destruction. And many, Jesus said, will enter in therein. But he also said, you don't have to go that way. There is another way. He said that straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth to life. Yet, only a few shall find it. And I'm here to tell you, church, that the only ones that are going to find the straight gate and the narrow way are the ones that refuse to go in a different way. Here it is. You know, I, that some years ago when Oprah had a show, Oprah had this guy on and said, there's many ways to get to heaven. Sometimes you got to tell evangelist Oprah, you need to go back to seminary. Because Jesus did not say, I, I am one of the ways. He did not say, I am the best way. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And he said, no man is going to get to my father set by me. In other words, what Jesus is saying is there are many ways to skin a cat, but there ain't but one way to get to heaven. Now, you can listen to evangelist Oprah if you want to, but you're going to mess around and miss heaven trying to get there a different way. But lastly, lastly, as Paul takes the final turn, Paul's word to all the saints is don't ever get down. Don't ever give up is one thing. Don't ever go differently. Paul said, here it is, don't ever get down on God. As Paul concludes this benediction, church, he wanted to remind them that what they were doing, Paul was saying, look, you all ain't doing nothing for me. Paul even wanted them to know you ain't even doing it for yourselves. 
But Paul's word was, brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. So Paul wanted them to know, look, if you're out there working and laboring, remember who you're working and laboring for. Because you are working and laboring for the one that really has all power in his hands. In other words, God don't need you to do nothing. So if you're going to do something for the Lord, don't do it half-heartedly. In other words, Paul said, if you're going to do it half-heartedly, then you might as well don't do it at all. Because God could, he can handle it if you were ice cold. But God said, I can't handle you if you're lukewarm. In other words, God said, I don't need no sometimey saints. I don't need no, I show up when I feel like showing up. I'll do what I want to do. God says, you might as well don't do anything. But that's the best you're going to do. Because just in case you don't know what this word means, this abounding Paul talks about. What abounding really means in layman's terms is to give the Lord your very best. Here's what shocks me, and I've been pastoring now a long time. It shocks me when, when church folks will brag about they don't ever miss no days at work. It's, it's amazing. Monday through Friday, they don't miss a day at work. They, 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 they'll do anything not to miss a day at work. They don't mind missing church. Sometimes I want to ask them, I wonder what your life would be like if God took as many days off as you take Sundays off. No, God says, give me your very best. Why? Because I gave you my very best. When God got ready to save us. God said, look, a bull won't do. I don't care if it is one without any blemishes. God said, the most beautiful white dove it still ain't good enough for my children. I'm going to give them my very best because I'm going to give them myself. Again, I don't know who it is that God is talking to right now, but the word that God has for you is, I will never, ever be satisfied with anything less than your very best. And see, God knows what our best is because God is the one that strengthens us. God is the one that blesses us every good gift coming from the Lord. So God knows what your best is. And that's why Jesus would say that the first and greatest commandment is not just to love the Lord. But he said to love the Lord with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul. And I want you to know, church, that if you're loving the Lord like this, and you're giving the Lord your very best, and if you don't know anything else, you ought to leave here knowing that your labors will not be in vain. If you loving the Lord and giving the Lord your very best, you need to know that it's just a matter of time before you begin to reap just what you've been sowing. It's just a matter of time before God starts answering your prayers. It's just a matter of time before he opens the windows and pour you out a blessing that you shall not have room enough to receive. So again, I don't know who it is that God is speaking to, but if you're going to be working, if you're going to be laboring for the Lord, then the one thing you can't afford to do is you can't afford to get down. You can't afford to get to the point that you're giving God half-hearted service. Because see, God, here it is. And when I say God wants your very best, I ain't talking about your Sunday best. Because God, God wants more than just your Sunday best. God said, I want your very best. Because God knows that some of our Sunday best is the best act. God, God, God knows that all of that singing and shouting, he says, you don't be singing and shouting like that when you leave church. All of that holy praying, I ain't heard from you holy praying when you leave church. God knows it ain't, it ain't how high you can jump or how, how loud you can shout on Sunday morning. God wants to know how straight are you walking Monday through Saturday. 
God said, if you ain't walking straight Monday through Saturday, you ain't walking that straight up on Sunday. And that's why, church, if you really one that's been out there laboring for the Lord, you ought to walk out of here with a made-up mind. And you ought to walk out of here with the knowledge of knowing who you are. Because I'm here to tell you that you're one of the king's kids. And when you're one of the king's kids, the one thing that you ought not ever do is don't live beneath your privilege. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Ain't nothing worse if you're a parent than seeing your kid living beneath their privilege. And if you feel that way about your children, how do you think God feels about his children? In other words, God is saying, don't you know who your daddy is? Don't you know what kind of power that your daddy had? Don't you know that your daddy can open doors that no man can shut? That your daddy can make a way out of no way? Yet you refuse to ask your daddy for what you need. In other words, God says, if you're down, you don't have to be down. And the reason you don't have to be down as one of the king's kids is you've always got some help. And you got the kind of help that'll always be there. You got the kind of help that'll fight your battles. You got the kind of help that will supply all of your needs. So the next time you're even thinking about getting down, remember what God said to his children in Psalm 24. Because there he said, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors. So the king of glory can come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord. Mighty in battle. The Lord, the one that died up on that old rugged cross. The Lord, the one that went down into that borrowed tomb. The Lord, the one that stayed there Friday and all day Saturday. The Lord, the one that got up early Sunday morning with all powers in his hands. He said, remember that whatever you're doing for me, it is not in vain. You want to make sure that what you're doing for the Lord, Paul says, then there's some things that you got to just make up in your mind that you're not going to do. Paul said, don't ever give up. Don't ever go differently. And don't ever get down on God. Come on, let us bless the Lord in this place. <laughs> Father God, in the precious name of Jesus, again, Lord, oh, we thank you, thank you, thank you for being so good to us, Lord. Oh, Lord, you have been better to us than we have been to ourselves, and even if we had a thousand tongues, we could not tell the story of all that you have done for us. And so, God, we just say thank you, thank you, thank you, Father God, for being so good. We thank you for looking beyond our faults and simply seeing our needs. We thank you, Lord, for now allowing us to intercede on behalf of the sick and the shut-in, Father God. Oh, Lord, we just pray that wherever your people are, Father God, wherever they are that are sick, wherever they are that are hurting, wherever they are that are in need, Father God, that you would dispatch your heavenly angels and have them to be by their side, Lord. Lord, we know that with just one touch, you have the power to heal these old bodies. And so, Lord, if it be thine will, Lord, we pray for healing. We pray for restoration. We pray that you would make them whole again. Oh, Father God, in the name of Jesus, we also pray for the bereaved and brokenhearted, Father God. We pray for all of those, Father God, that are, that are still uh, bereaving those that they have had to say their final goodbyes, Father God. Oh, Lord, we, we know that you said that earth has no sorrow, that heaven cannot heal, but earth does have some sorrows that will make you hurt. And so, Father God, we pray that you would be there to heal the hurt, to mend the broken hearts. Then, Father God, again, we pray for this branch of Zion. We pray, Father God, that you would continue to keep us in favor. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to bless us. We pray, Father God, that you would continue to send us everything that we stand in need of. Oh, Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we just thank you and we praise you here today. Then now, Father God, as we've done everything that you've asked us to do, Lord, we now open the doors of your church. And we pray, Father God, if there's anyone here under the sound of my voice that needs to be saved. 
anyone that has not given their life to you wholly and completely. Oh, Father God, in the name of Jesus, we pray now that you would minister to them. Let them know that right now they too can be saved. We also pray, Father God, for that person that is saved, Father God. They have been saved, but they're not living like it. Instead, Father God, they strayed away from your path of righteousness. And what they need to do today while they still have time, is they need to come back home. And so, Father God, whoever that person is that needs to come back home, we pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you would order their steps back to you. Lastly, Father God, we pray for that person in need of a church home. If they're local here to Raleigh, Lord, we pray that you would connect them with Martin Street Baptist Church. Where, but if they're not local, Father God, we pray wherever they are that you would open the doors of a local congregation, Father God. We pray that you would open the doors and open them wide so that all your children might come inside. And so, Father God, in the name of Jesus now, Lord, you said that your word will never return to your void, but it shall accomplish your will. So if it be thine will, Father God, we pray now that someone, Father God, will say yes to you. Someone will come back home. Someone will seek church membership. In the name of Jesus, we do pray. Let the church say, amen. Is there one today? I want to be saved. Is there one that says, look, I want to be restored? Or is there one that says, look, I want to be a member of God's church? I want to be a member of Martin Street Baptist Church. I, I want to be a part of what God is doing. Is there one? Hallelujah, is there one? Amen. Well, today is the first Sunday, and on the first Sunday at Martin Street Baptist Church, we do participate and recognize the holy ordinance of Holy Communion or the Lord's Supper. This is something that as a body of believers we are commanded to offer. It is not something that any person is commanded to receive. The Lord does issue a warning in his word and says, Whosoever eateth and drinketh of this cup unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to themselves. What the Lord is saying is before you eat of this bread, before you drink of this cup, seek the Lord forgiveness of all of your sins. If anyone has committed a trespass against you, now is the time to forgive them so that you can eat worthily of the representation of his body and his blood. If you do not have a cup, if you would raise your hand, we will we'll try to we'll get one to you. Anybody not have a cup? Let us stand as we pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Again, Lord, we thank you and we praise you for this tremendous opportunity that you have given us to once again dine at your table. We thank you, Father God, for these elements that have been prepared for us. We thank you for the bread that represents your body. We thank you for this cup that represents your blood. And we pray now, Father God, that your Holy Spirit, your holy anointing, and your holy presence will fall down fresh and anew on each and every one of them. And as we eat them, Father God, we pray that we'll be anointed in the outside. And that anointing will filter out to the outside so that we might be transformed into the image of your son. In Jesus' name we do pray. Let the church say amen. At this time, we invite you to read responsibly as this text comes across our screen. I will read the light and I invite you to read the dark. The Lord's Supper. For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took the bread. After the same manner, he took the cup. And when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat of this bread and drink of this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For 
For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. On that faithful night when the Lord had gathered his disciples in the upper room, he knew that his betrayer was right there amongst them. But even knowing that, he said to them that this bread represents my body, which shall be broken for you. And we know that he went to Calvary's cross and his body was broken, beaten, and battered for you and I. And he says, as often as we eat of this bread, we do show his death until he comes again. So let us take, break, and eat in remembrance of what he did for us. After they had eaten the bread, he then took the cup. And he said that this cup represents the New Testament in my blood. He said to them, as he says to us, that there is no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. Again, we know that he went to Calvary's cross and he shed his precious and his priceless blood so that you and I may have access to the tree of life. And he says, do ye this as often as ye can in remembrance of me. So let us take and drink in remembrance of him. And we go out singing, let us, you know the song, let us break bread together. Father God, in the precious name of Jesus, again, we thank you, we praise you, and we do honor you. And now unto him who's able to keep all of us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding ecstatic, overwhelming joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be dominion and power, will glory and majesty this day henceforth and forevermore and let the church say amen let us break bread together